This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, the Dean of all things STEM and STEAM, and this is the ninth season of Solve It for Kids, the science podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer, and welcome back, listeners. We are starting off our brand new season with something that we have all at least thought about once. Uh, absolutely. So what problem are we solving today? What's it like to experience zero G? What is it like to experience zero G? Now, I don't know if I have thought about doing this or if I'm okay (laughs) with doing this, but I'm really excited to learn about someone who does this all of the time. So who is our guest today, Jeff? Our guest today is the terrific Tim Bailey. He is in-flight manager for the company Zero G. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and we are thrilled to have you. We're going to be talking about zero gravity, which is really microgravity and how you do it in a plane and all of these different things. Oh my gosh, there's so much space happening today. So I'm curious, as a kid, did you always want to go to space? I did. So ah, uh, okay. yeah, I, I always wanted to be an astronaut growing up and I never thought I would be a flight attendant on the way <laughs> to that career goal, but it turns out it's the perfect place to be. I get to train astronauts. I get to be in charge of safety in the cabin of our aircraft while we're taking people up to, to train and to do research. So it's actually given me more microgravity time than some of the early astronauts were able to get on their actual space missions. Oh, that's crazy. I was just thinking that as you were describing it. If you're the one that's on the plane all the time training them, you're doing it way more than they are. What is your first memory for you of getting that experience? Oh, goodness. Uh, So I've been working for Zero Gravity Corporation for 21 years now. I actually started as an intern for the company. Okay. Yeah, we weren't even flying at that point. So I got to come down and help put the plane together. So one of my earliest memories wow. is really of being on the plane when we were still deciding like what parts wow. to put in and, and how to do lights and things and getting to see something I had never thought about before, which was how aircraft are maintained and all the parts and ah. things that get pulled off. So Hi. my first experience was really the guts and the inside of the airplane, which was fascinating. Okay. And I knew nothing about it. <laughs> Okay, so can you tell everyone who maybe isn't familiar with Zero G, like, what is this program and, you know, how does it involve the plane? Sure. So Zero G is a commercial space tourism company. We Mm -hmm. offer people the experience of weightlessness. So we have an Ah. aircraft, a a modified 727 aircraft. So it's an older model airplane that used to run passengers and then cargo And we take and climb and dive that aircraft in what's called a parabolic arc. Uh, So it's just a gentle curve that goes up, crests, and then comes right back down the other side. Symmetrical curve that we fly it in. And during that parabolic arc, we know how to fly it exactly right by hand so that everything is in free fall as we come over the top of that. So if you can imagine as you're drawing that line right as you're, you're starting to go up. They pull the engines back, they tilt the nose down, and everything in the plane is falling right with the plane over the top and then down the other side. Yeah. It's the exact same physics as being in space. Everything is falling up and over at the same rate. So inside wow. the cabin, nobody's stuck to the floor. We're all falling at the same rate. So it's in zero G. That's what we think of as weightless because we're all falling at the same rate. So we can push around, learn how astronauts move in space. Researchers get about 30 seconds uh, for each of these parabolas. Oh my gosh. Science experiments or test procedures. So we fly the plane. We do a series of those arcs up and down in those parabolas, uh, give people six or seven minutes of microgravity time. 
And then we we land just like any other aircraft. So taking off and landing, we do just like any other plane. It's just when we're up in the sky, we do these neat parabolic arcs to give us the time that we need in free fall. Wow. And you let people out of the seats for that, right? Because, you know, like we're all used to regular plane travel where, you know, sit still and buckle in, but you let them actually float around? Oh, yeah. Well, up to 10,000 feet, we have all those same rules. I actually have to do the the oxygen mask demo oh, and okay. fasten seatbelts while seated. <laughs> and those yeah. kinds of things. But once the captain turns the fasten seatbelt sign off, it changes dramatically because wow. we really take those seatbelts yeah. off. So we the front two thirds of the aircraft, about 66 feet of that plane is all padded. So floor, ceiling, walls, oh, everything good. padded on it. <laughs> So we pull everybody out from the seats and up front. We actually take people's shoes away unless they're doing some scientific research. Who knows what kind of shoes you wore that day? Oh, right? yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want people floating around and it's unusual. It's something different that people aren't used to. So we really try to make it as comfortable and safe for them as possible. And part of that is taking shoes and bagging them up and storing them and strapping them down because the whole plane is in free fall. The pilots, everyone in the cabin, everything in the aircraft. So we have to be really careful that we don't leave something out on a seat or leave a drawer open in our flight attendant compartment because things will float away just like they do in space. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So I also want to jump right in. You said you do a series of these arcs, about 30 seconds each. And you're giving each of your passengers six to seven minutes, which means you're doing quite a few. I imagine a lot of people are not very tummy comfortable with this situation. (laughs) Would that be accurate? That's not as accurate as you would think. So I know that that when NASA did these flights, they got a a reputation for people being sick on them a lot. And uh, NASA flew researchers. So that was their goal was to get research done. And so they were focused mostly on, we need to maximize the amount of time we can give to researchers. I don't care how you're feeling. I don't care if you're having fun. That's not why you're here. Ah. And so we've learned over time how to do things to help people acclimate better to the microgravity environment and to that up and down motion, like we were saying, uh, because when you're in Hi. microgravity, you're floating around, you're doing some aerobics. But on the bottom part of that curve, we actually pick up all of that momentum that we had falling and we have to burn that off and pull back up into the next one, much like you would feel at, say, the bottom of a roller coaster, right? You've got all of that momentum going down (laughs) and you then have to pick it all back up and go up the next hill. So we experience about 1.8 Gs, so about 1.8 times your body weight. Okay. So we have everyone lay on those mats on the floor for that. And sometimes that's what gets people is that moving back and forth. But we give people the opportunity to eat a light breakfast that we've curated to know that <laughs> it's a good thing for people to have. And we also start them off with some lunar or Martian gravity parabolas first. We can actually shallow out our dive a bit and make it feel like you're on the moon or like you're on Mars when you're inside the plane. So that would be, you know, if you're on Mars, that would be three fifths of your weight. Okay. Um, okay. Why? Okay. Right about one third. And then if you're on the moon, you're at about one sixth of your weight. So it it lets people start to feel and their brains start to process this new experience that they're having where they don't need to push as hard. Things move at a different speed than what they're used to. So part of the way we acclimate people and NASA did not do that. They were not interested. (laughs) (laughs) They're all about the science, man. (laughs) Right. We also know to cap it at a certain number of parabolas so that that people feel good when they get off the plane, unless they're doing research, you know, and need that scientific data that they're getting from there. Very cool. I have known about the zero G flights for for a while now, but I did not know until just now that you could adjust it for Martian gravity or moon gravity. That is really neat to learn. It is. It's also the only way that you can really get those gravities on earth that you can simulate wow, okay. those well enough right. for, for researchers to do things like fluid experiments or dust experiments so they've got yeah. okay. simulated lunar dust that they can then kick up and watch how it falls or whether it sticks to the wheels so it's really fundamental science that they get to do even though they only have 30 seconds or so i uh, was to gonna do yeah i was gonna ask that so i mean Can you tell us about some of the experiments that they've done? Because 30 seconds is not a whole lot of time to do something. I'm assuming maybe they do it repeatedly. So like they get more data over 
the six or seven minutes? Exactly. So usually the researchers are dividing up the task into some small pieces that they're looking okay. at. We've had people that were doing things like chilling fluid lines. They were looking at making rockets oh, and knowing that the rockets wow. would have to reignite their engines once they were in space. Right. Once you're in orbit, everything's in free fall and the fluid doesn't stay at the bottom of the tank. Yes. And so how do they pull fluid from a tank up into the fluid lines? Those fluid lines don't stay cold the same way. So how do they make ah. sure that they get gas or liquid that they're looking for and not the wrong thing? So there's a lot of those kinds of processes. Some okay. people have done things like 3D printing. I don't know if you've heard of the 3D printer that they have up on the space station. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they developed that on our aircraft. So they went through oh, a lot cool. of trial and no error. Yeah. yeah. So the companies that have been doing those tried a lot of different printing methods, a lot of different nozzle designs, and they could do in 30 seconds a pretty quick print to see, was it sticking together? Is it right. too hot, too cold? You know, they could do those things. They don't need to print a four-hour contraption. Yeah, they right. Know whether or not are the layers sticking. And so that's really what they're looking for, that type of thing while they're on the plane. Oh, that's really cool. There's a lot of science that can happen in there. I have recently read some articles that films have been made to make it look like astronauts are floating weightless. Is that true? Yes. So NASA actually did all the filming for the movie Apollo 13. So if you've seen any of that, yes. all of the yes. shots that they did inside the capsules uh, while they were going to and from the moon, all right. of that was shot in a KC-135. So that was a NASA aircraft that they shot that in. And NASA very quickly learned that it was a very long process and they used up a lot of their aircraft's time <laughs> uh, to do that. So they were happy when we came along and were able to do that. We've done some things like we did some filming for a movie called The Matrix. I don't know if you've ever heard of Oh, uh, yeah. Some like fight sequences. How do you fight in zero gravity? There was yeah. Agent Smith and Neo were fighting as they were flying around. So they did some sort of testing for that. Oh my God. We've done commercials for things. We've done unboxings. So yeah, you can come up and do media shots. Sometimes it's just getting the right look to something. And then they'll go back and they'll do some CGI around that. Right. They want to see, right. What does it really look like floating? What does this thing really look like? How would it react? I can usually tell when people are on wires because they all pivot right around their hips, right where those oh, wires are. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Okay. And from experience, my center of gravity is not always at my hips. Sometimes if I've got on heavy shoes, those shoes throw my center of gravity much lower. Or yeah. if I don't have on shoes and I pull my legs up, now my center of gravity is much higher in my body. Wow. Uh, so it changes based on how you're, you're moving, almost like a ballet or an ice skater. Yeah, so right, exactly. Body Where they're, control, yeah. Can do. yeah. What is it like? I mean, you've gone, I mean, I don't even know how many times, but like... You've watched a lot of people experience zero G for the first time. What are all their reactions? I mean, besides possibly puking, right? But like, are they just like, holy cow, they don't know what to do with themselves? Or, you know, share with us. Sure. I've done about just shy of 10,000 parabolas. Right? Holy so, cow. Oh my That's goodness. That's a lot. Yeah. I've, I've flown over 400 flights, both with zero G and with NASA. And Wow. wow. Every time it's incredible. It's hard to describe to people because it's almost like describing chocolate to someone yeah. that's never had chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, you can get close, yes. yeah. but it's not exactly the same. So it's a little bit like being underwater, but there's nothing to push against, right? The air, you can't push against it to move around. And you don't feel that sense of down that we, we still often feel in water. It's kind of like skydiving and that you're free out in the air, but again, no air to move against and definitely none of that roar of air. Mostly what people experience when they do their first parabola mm -hmm. is giddiness. They're just <laughs> joyful. Uh, and I don't care how old someone is, they will likely start giggling and laughing. <laughs> and for many adults, it's the first time that they've had a truly novel physical experience yeah. since childhood. Yeah. How yeah. often do we do something that's completely new for our bodies? Right. And so right. this is just like joy on their face at something completely unexpected and new that they've got to try to process now. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. It, it kind of reminds me, you know, as a kid, we like do swings. And then as a kid, we all jumped off, right? Because we're like, hey, you know, at the top when your mom tells you not to, right? 
So I'm wondering if that's kind of the feeling that we all had the power as you as you're flying and then you land on the ground, of course, hopefully you land well off the swing. But, you know, that's the thing that it just made me think of is you feel for a few seconds as you're flying in the air off the swing, you feel free. It's very similar to that. I think I used to swing up and let the swing kind of drop me a little bit. I don't know if you ever did that without even even coming off. And that that drop is kind of the same. But again, my body is still falling down. I can sort of feel that as it's happening. So it's it's close to that. It's still different because my eyes, my ears, so my otoliths in my ears that tell my body, you know, even with my eyes closed where I'm pointed and my visual uh, as to where people are in the cabin and what's right and wrong. And then my proprioceptive system, which is that part of our body that tells us that our feet are on the ground or that yes. we, we're sitting on something. We can feel it with those yes. parts. Right. Of, and none of those pieces are saying either the right things or the same <laughs> thing. And so that can also be confusing for people's bodies. There's some research that that might be a candidate for why people don't feel well is that their body thinks they've been poisoned because none of these senses oh, are lining up correctly. Okay. 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 One of the most okay. interesting things I've ever done on the plane, and, and you were asking about, you know, experiences that I love, yeah. was I got to flip upside down and put my feet on the top of the cabin and okay. I, okay. I was pushing myself down and sort of holding myself there by putting my hand on the floor. But okay. I think it was the floor. Cabin's about seven feet tall. So if I stretch really hard, I can I can put my toes on the ceiling and my hand on the floor. Right. And immediately, instantly, my brain said, Oh, thank goodness. I know what's going on now. Your feet are on the floor because they're pressing down. Um, and I looked and my brain tried to tell me that the floor was now the ceiling and the ceiling was now the floor. That and I makes knew sense. intellectually yeah. that was not true. Yeah. yeah. But my brain was working so hard to try to figure out what was going on on this plane that it said, oh, good. Now I know. And I said, well, now I can never trust my brain again to tell me. What's <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Does it change your perspective of how your body moves on Earth? That's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. I think I probably do, just because I've I've experienced it in so many different kinds of accelerations, right? Like I've done, right. I've yeah. slipped on a pad because we have the, the big pads that are in the plane. And so, you know, I've, okay. I've bounced along in lunar gravity. So when I'm running... In 1G, I feel how heavy it is. I've got enough experience now where I can walk around in that 1.8 Gs if I need to, to do something. Oh, and so okay. that's a much different experience, yes. right? Everything is accelerated. We don't let anyone new do that because if they happen to fall, they would hit the ground before their arms would come out to catch them. Ah, uh, right. so fast in that 1.8 G acceleration that our reflexes just aren't built for it. So yes, I think... I feel okay. that difference now and I can sort of play with that difference when I'm on the plane. We have some great videos where one of our coaches, Laurel, was tossing an apple in 1.8 Gs and then in Martian G and Lunar G and then just letting it float in zero G. And it really okay. showed the difference that you feel when you're in all of those different gravities. So Wow. It's, That's really it's pretty cool. Neat. So I am curious, do you have to take a physical before you go on this? You know, do you have recommendations, you know, for people that get motion sick? Is this something they can still do? I'm just curious about how all this works. Can you just sign up to do this? Or are there some things you should know about your body before you go on this? (laughs) Like any activity that you're going to do, there are waivers and things to sign saying that you understand that this is going to be an experience for you. Uh, right. To make sure that you can take that one point right. H, that you can do those things. And then if you have any questions about heart conditions or, or anything like that, go talk to your doctor. Make sure right. that they think that this is something you can do. Can you have fun for 30 or 45 minutes? That's really my question. Can yes. you go to a trampoline park and feel like you were going to be okay? If the answer is yes, then then you can probably come on our plane. But we've also had people like Stephen Hawking. Professor Hawking had oh, wow. flew on our plane. I remember. Prior to his death. Yeah. And he was severely disabled right. in a wheelchair, did not have very much body motion at all, and was able to fly on our plane safely. So he flew and That's did fantastic. a number of parabolas and had a wonderful time. We've taken people of all ages up into their 90s up on wow. the Wow. No nice. problem. We've also had a group called Astro Access that's been doing research into universal design and accessibility for spacecraft 
come on board. And some of those researchers were blind and low vision. Some of them were deaf and hard of hearing. Okay. Uh, Some of them had mobility differences or used mobility chairs to get around normally. Right. They had had a series of experiments they were doing and research they were doing into, you know, movement on board, how to feel tactile differences in directional signage when you were floating. That's so cool. Okay. All these things that they want to now get rolled into spacecraft and space station design. So right. anybody could potentially come on board the the aircraft. Now, if, if you're prone to motion sickness and you want something for that, again, we have Dramamine, uh, uh, just you know, okay. basic motion sickness. We also have cool relief bands that we give people to put on their wrists. So it sends oh, yes. a electric pulse. Have you used one of those? I know of them. I haven't used one, but I know of them. Yeah. They use one of the nerves in the arm. Uh, so I can feel it if I put it on there just to, to test it out, see if it's yeah. working. I can feel it in my fingers. And it sends an electrical pulse up and down through the nervous system to sort of disrupt some of those sensations that you get when you're weightless. So it confuses the brain a little bit so that it's not as likely (laughs) to listen to any one part. But of course, some people take stronger things. NASA used to give out scopalamine, which is a a really powerful anti-nausea medication. But it also makes people tired. And so then they have to give them dexedrine, uh, which is a controlled... (laughs) substance. Well, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah, right. I mean, I've talked to astronauts before, as I'm sure we all have. And the one thing they like to say is when you're in space, there's no up or down. And so when I talk to kids, when I go out and do my school visits, I tell them that and they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, there's no up, just like you were saying how you are standing upside down. And the other thing is, is I was talking to astronaut Katie Coleman, and she was telling me how difficult it is to move things in space like just to push something it takes multiple people pushing off of stuff have you guys ever like done any experiments like that like try to move things when you're in zero g or we recently had a space suited astronaut they were testing out new spacesuits, and those things oh. are pretty heavy they're several hundred pounds they are yeah right and so to get them up and moving it would often take four or five people to get them moving now the trick is when we're in zero G, just like Katie said, you have to brace against something else. Yes. Because if you and I were floating together and we pushed, we would both that's, push apart. That's what she you know, said. That's a, this is physics, right? Like we're going to yep. push off of each other and move apart relative to our pers- respective masses, right? Like yes. how much of me and how much of you there is and where we push. But also if we push with just our hands, we'll probably both go backwards. Right. We'll start ah, rotating around right. our center of mass. So there's all those little things you have to get. So, again, I brace on the ceiling. Nobody on audio can hear this, but I'm putting a hand up on the ceiling with my feet on the floor. And that gives me one hand to push people or grab people. Ah, OK. But if for some reason I stop thinking about it and I grab with both hands, there's nothing to stop me from not moving. <laughs> and I've had that before where I put my hands out to stop someone. And I did an effective stop for them by absorbing all of their momentum. Oh, and then you like, got yes, pushed back. And then you go yeah. bye-bye. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So you have been doing this for so long, and you've had so many different experiences on there. I would like to ask, what is one of the funniest experiences or most memorable besides, say, Professor Hawking? which had to be pretty cool, that comes right to mind of, wow, I get to do this. Oh, I would say it's probably working with water. So we had a TV Uh, show, a Japanese TV show that was filming. And one of the tasks that they had for their performers was to wash their face in zero G. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. So if you've ever seen videos from the space station, you know that when water gets released into a microgravity, a free fall environment, it just turns into a sphere, right? Like this tension takes over as the primary factor and it pulls itself into a sphere. So we were doing that by popping water balloons and letting that that giant sphere. Now, when somebody comes and hits that sphere, if they disrupt that surface tension, it sort of pops into a a bunch of smaller balls of water, right? They just like And so for 10 or, or 12 parabolas, those people kept trying and they kept hitting the water really hard with their hands and it would just splatter everywhere, hit it and splatter. And finally on the last one, the guy managed to gently cup it. And so it stuck to his hands and he brought it up to his face and he puts it on his face and it hears the water and opens his eyes. Wow. Under the water. Wow. 
because now the water has stuck to him. If you think it, it's almost like slime where slime sticks right, to everything. Right, right, right. So it just adhered to his face, the surface tension of his face. And so when he opened his eyes, he was underwater. But oh, he also wow. quickly realized that his mouth and nose were also covered. Yes. And that water starts creeping along the surface of skin. I've had that happen. And so he had a little bit of panic in his eyes because he realized he could not breathe. He had now oh, right. underwater with no way to get it out. Now, we came out of the parabola a couple of seconds later and all the water fell off of his face. But that was one of the most memorable things that he would never considered and we didn't either. That when no. he put the water over, he was sealed in. Yes. Right. Yes. Wow. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That what was an now experience. I love playing with water with people, you know, them trying to eat it out of the air, but even just putting it on my hand and looking at it because it looks like a gel where it's it's stuck with surface right. tension. Right. Yeah. And it sort of bubbles up on there. And that is not the way I expect water to work. That is not <laughs> anything. <laughs> no. Like none of our instincts, none of our evolutionary, you know, expectations are that water will react that way. So it's just fascinating to give my brain a whole new data set about something oh I think gosh. I know as well as water. Oh my gosh, that's wild. That makes you think, wow, so differently about everything. Before we get to the challenge, can you tell everybody how they might participate in Zero G? There are a number of different programs that NASA and other people have going where students and teachers and researchers can come on board the aircraft. So NASA will pay for some of that to do. A lot of that is through universities or small business wow. grants. So there's a lot of ways that you can get on board to do research if that's something you're interested in doing. Fluid research, we've biology research, we've seen surgery in space oh, uh, wow. in the on our aircraft. Wow. All kinds of interesting things. And then we also do some flights that are just for individuals that want a weightless experience and want to train like an astronaut. So right. you can usually okay. find a flight that is for individuals who want to come in and do a weightless experience and find out what that's like. And so that's where we take off shoes. We play with water and jelly beans. You might be able to bring a stuffed animal with you to float around. Uh -huh. Nice. And so that's all through our website, gozerog.com. Same thing on all the socials to go and see some of the videos of, of the people and the researchers that we have and get some ideas for what you could do on board the aircraft. Oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. Yes. Okay, so now we are at the time in our show where we ask our guests to give our listeners a challenge. I'm curious what our challenge is going to be on this, for <laughs> Tim. <laughs> well, I can't challenge people to float around. So what I'd love for people to do is to think about the difference between how much they weigh and their mass. So ah. on the plane, your mass never changes. How much of you there is never yes. changes. It's just the acceleration that we're under. So when we're all in free fall, when the plane and everyone in it is in free fall... We seem to weigh nothing. If you had a scale, it would read zero when right. you're on it. But if you were, say, in lunar gravity, you would weigh about one sixth. So that same mass would then have a, a smaller acceleration on it than Earth, and it would show one sixth. Okay. On Mars, it would be about one third. It's three fifths, but one third is an easier thing to do. Divide by yes. three. And then when we're in that steep pullout, it's almost twice your weight. So you feel like you weigh oh, wow. twice as much. So I'd love for all, all right. of the listeners to do those calculations. So see what you would weigh at twice your weight. Right. And then at one third of your weight and then one sixth of your weight so that you get an idea of what it might be like, you know, how you would move if you weighed twice as much as you do right now. Right. How would you move if you weighed only a third of what you do right now, right? Wow. That's, a, that's a very different ways of moving. You need to move much lighter and much easier as you get less acceleration on you. Yeah. I mean, that's physics, right? Everybody, like, you have to learn physics and how it works. But this sounds like it would be an amazing experience. So we hope everybody goes to your website and checks it out and thinks about it. Because, I mean, hey, you could learn so much in just, what, six minutes, right? Six or yeah. seven minutes of of microgravity. Wow. Learn That's... to not trust your brain. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's just one more tool that we have, one more way that we experience the universe, right? And you, you always want to make sure that your tool is calibrated correctly. So you got to work on calibrating that brain as well. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my gosh. I love this, it. Tim, this, this has been awesome. This has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for being on Salt for Kids, Tim. You're welcome. It was great to be here. What an exciting episode to start off a new season. Yeah. And whether you think you would be willing to jump on this plane to experience Zero-G, 
everybody that likes space, likes to learn about zero G and kind of what's happening. And as we're going to be sending more astronauts out into space, as we go back to the moon and push on to Mars, we need to know more about what's going to happen to the body in zero G. This was a fun episode. It really was. And I learned a lot about it. I don't know that it's changed my mind about doing this, mostly (laughs) because I get motion sickness. However, I think it was really cool to learn about microgravity and also the cool experiments that they do on this plane yes. to learn more. So it's not just, they I mean, do it, it is a fun. It's a fun thing, but also you learn stuff. And so the challenge, too, of calculating your weight on Moon and Mars versus the Earth, I always think that's yes. so fun. Don't you think that's fun? Oh, absolutely. Calculating both. Earth, Moon, Mars, and learning the difference between weight and mass, which is critically important when you're experiencing zero-G and when you're just learning about humans going to space. That is an important distinction. What an absolutely fun, great episode to start off a new season. Yes, this was a great episode for our new season. So if you liked this episode or if you want to experience zero-G or already have, and you want to share your experience with us, be sure to tag us on our social media. We are at KidSalt at Facebook, X, and Instagram. And check out our podcast, SolveItSciencePodcast.com, where you can learn all about this episode and you can get recommendations for books to read more about space and all of the rest of our episodes are there. We would love to hear from you, so be sure to reach out. Solve It For Kids is the science podcast for kids and families. Until next time, you'll hear Jen and Jeff on Solve Solve It it For for Kids. Kids.